Hello and welcome to the Earth Rangers podcast. I'm Earth Ranger Emma, your guide into the awesome world of animal and wildlife facts. Earth Rangers! Earth Rangers! Earth Rangers! I'm so excited about this episode because today is the day when we'll get to test our new experimental device that lets us talk to animals. Oh, I can't wait! If we get this right, it could be huge. Huge. But more on that later. First up, we've got a brand new segment called Ultimate Animal Showdown. Ultimate Showdown. Ultimate Showdown. This is where we do a head-to-head -head comparison of two animal species. Today's contenders are... Eagles versus Falcons. Falcons. No, we're not talking about the football teams. We're talking about two different birds of prey. Yes, yes, I know, there are tons of cool birds of prey like hawks, vultures, and owls. But for today's showdown, let's focus on eagles and falcons. Round one. The first major difference is the size and build. While eagles have a broad-chested body, falcons are slim and lean. On average, eagles are about twice as big as falcons. The biggest ones can have a wingspan of up to 280 centimeters. That's wider than a school bus. That's why eagles are the clear winners in this category, with their heavy and strong build earning them the title Titans of the Sky. Round two. Flying skills. It's pretty easy to tell an eagle from a falcon just by watching them fly. Eagles have broad, rounded wings and tend to soar, while falcons fly by steadily flapping their pointy, curved wings, which allow them to make sharp turns, rapid climbs, and dives. This makes falcons, especially the peregrine, some of the fastest flyers in the world. This point clearly goes to the falcon. Round three. Next up, hunting techniques. Eagles catch their prey by grabbing it and then crushing it in their incredibly strong talons, which is another word for claws. Their grip is so strong that they could easily crush a coconut. Falcons, on the other hand, have much smaller talons, but they use them to surprise and disable prey with a high-speed mid-air falcon punch. Oh, you can... After that, falcons will go in for a bite attack because unlike eagles, falcons have a sharp tooth on the end of their beak. Equal score for both on this one. Final round. We all know that inspiring call of the bald eagle that makes us think of freedom, the great outdoors, and the spirit of adventure. <whistles> Wrong. That sound is actually from a different member of the bird of prey family, the red-tailed hawk. Their call is often used in movies to make eagles sound cooler, because in reality, the bald eagle's call is pretty weak sounding. No offense. The falcon's call is much more piercing and can be heard from a good distance away. So, who's the winner in our bird of prey showdown? I'm going to let you decide. I think they are both magnificent and impressive species, and it's always exciting when you get a chance to spot one in the wild. All right, Earth Rangers. During the last three episodes, I've discussed chilly topics like hibernation, I crawled through a damp, dark cave to find out more about bats, and I went to the freezing South Pole to talk about penguins. I'm starting to ask myself, why does it always have to be cold and dark places? Why can't I have some sunshine and butterflies instead? Literally. So today, we're going to talk about pollinators. Yay! Wild and wacky animal facts. Oh, can you smell that? <sighs> Breathe in deeply. Those wildflowers smell amazing. And there are butterflies all around. There's a monarch butterfly, and, and that one's a swallowtail. Wow, it's so beautiful. But let's get back to pollination. Here's how it works. Pollination happens when a powder called pollen is moved from plant to plant. Pollen is made in one part of the plant called an anther and is moved to a different part of another plant called a stigma. When this happens, a seed is formed which will eventually grow into a new plant. Pollinators like butterflies help move pollen around, which is why they're so important. Besides butterflies, there are many other pollinators like flies, wasps, moths, beetles, 
hummingbirds, and even some animals you wouldn't expect to be in the pollination business, like bats, lemurs, and geckos. Did you notice that I left out one crucial species? That's right, bees. Bees are the pollination superstars. They are the top pollinators in North America and one of the most important groups of pollinators on the planet. Next time you see a bee in your backyard or in a park, take a closer look. You might be able to see pollination in action. When a bee lands on a flower, it isn't really trying to pollinate it. It's looking for something to eat. Bees eat pollen and a sweet liquid made by flowers called nectar. Pollen is easy to find, but the nectar is located deep in the middle of the flower. To get to the nectar, the bee accidentally brushes up against the anthers, and when it does, pollen gets caught on tiny hairs on the bee's legs and body. Then, when the bee flies to another flower, some of the pollen brushes off onto the stigma of that plant, and boom! Pollination. Nearly 80% of all flowering plants are pollinated this way, so it's easy to see how important these pollinators are. Unfortunately, some pollinator populations are declining, which is why I want to find out what we can do to help them. So, I think it's time to pay a visit to someone who knows a lot about bees. Conservation Conversation. All right, Earth Rangers, we are here at Pioneer Brand Honey Farm to talk to Apiarist Andre, and he's going to give us all the buzz about bees. Hey, Andre, how you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm good. Can we go check out the hive? Let's buzz on down. W wait, uh, don't I need protective gear so I don't get stung? Today you will be okay. We're going to observe for the most part and have a little peek and my bees are very gentle. Just try to keep your moves from being quick and sudden. You can watch. Some of the bees as they come in have pollen on their legs. So what are they busy doing? What are they busy doing? They are busy. It's been a cold spell and they've been kind of stuck indoors uh, the past few days. Most flowers won't produce nectar until we get above 21 degrees Celsius. Mm. And, and we finally got to that temperature so you can see and maybe you can hear podcast listeners, all of these bees at work here. Um, they are out flying looking for nectar and pollen to bring back to, mm -hmm. to their nest mates. And these are honeybees, right? These are European honeybees, yes. So what's the difference between a honeybee and a bumblebee? So the difference between honeybees and bumblebees, uh, honeybees are mostly social insects. They get up to colonies that are 70,000 in number uh, in, in, in the peak times. And they rely on keeping nest mates with them over the winter to protect them, keep them warm. Whereas bumblebees and almost all the other types of bees that are native to Ontario actually um, overwinter only with a single queen. So can you tell us about the life cycle of the honeybee? Sure, so uh, there's worker bees, there's drone bees, and there's queen bees. There's three different types of bees inside mm -hmm. the colony. All these bees you've seen coming and going, almost all of them, or 98% of them, are worker bees. You'll see a few bees um, that are drones, and they're much larger. If you look closely at them, they have great big eyeballs and really big, powerful mm. wings. They're mm. also much larger than the other bees. And this is because drones are only, they're, they, they can't feed themselves, they don't collect food, they don't have stingers to defend the hive. Their only purpose is to go out to what we call drone congregation areas and, and find a queen to mate with. So the queen controls the other bees. How does she do that? Um, she does control how everything goes in the colony. Her pheromones or her smell, we call them pheromones, they're special chemicals that, the, the, that she produces. She's telling them how hard to work, um, how clean to be, how hard to defend the hive or not. So good queen makes for a good hive then? Yes. Now we've heard that um, bees are facing some threats right now. Sure. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So bees, like any other um, living creature, have uh, pests, predators, and other problems and, and th that they'll face. So uh, as you can all hear, there's a lot of bees coming and going. And um, these bees are going anywhere they please. And uh, to make, you know, to know that the, the environments that they're gathering their food from is clean, um, is, is very 
difficult to control mm -hmm. because they can, you know, there was a study in the UK a few years ago that showed bees flying a 17 kilometer round trip to gather heather from the moors. That's a great thing, but it's also problematic in that, um, you know, they, they can get into forage that we just don't know is out there. Mm -hmm. A farmer may have just sprayed something, you know, with a range that far, it's difficult. Of course, pesticides aren't the only problem that bees face. Yeah. Is there anything that earth rangers can do to help the bees? The important thing is that our native pollinators um, are, are, are staying healthy. And uh, the more forage we can plant and have flowers that, that, that bloom from early in the season to the, to the end of the fall in your gardens or... So if we plant a variety of wildflowers, for example, near our houses, that'll be helpful? It does help, yeah, especially with, you know, bumblebees or solitary bees. Because they're in such small environments, they're solitary. They're literally on their own. They're not social like these guys. One little bit of flower, one little bit of forage can make their day or their life possible. Mm -hmm. Whereas if there's nothing close by. So yes, absolutely. It may not help my honeybees, but it will absolutely help mm -hmm. pollinators. Well, thank you so much for telling us about bees. My pleasure. All right, bye. Conservation. Conversation. There we have it. The best way to help bees and other pollinators like butterflies is to build a pollinator garden. And you know, there are thousands of earth rangers who have done just that. Over 6,800 of you have accepted the pollinator power mission and used the regional planting guides to find out which flowers are right for attracting and providing nutritious food for the pollinators in the area they live in. It's a great example of how we can all work together and make a big difference. Some of our members even went above and beyond to help bees. There's Ranger Joel, for example. He started Joel's Bee Factory, a company that specializes in making bee condos. What's a bee condo? You can find out by going to earthrangers.com slash podcast. On this episode's show notes, we feature an exclusive interview with Joel. So check that out. <laughs> The moment has come for us to test the device, our secret machine that lets us talk to animals. As you know, Earth Ranger Riley, aka the engineer, aka Miss I only use big sciencey words to make my friend Emma feel unsmart, told us that all we need to do is provide the device with some recordings of people impersonating animals, and boy did we ever get some great submissions. So let me fire up the device and feed in the first one. My name is Michaela. I'm from Brampton, Ontario. And this is what a robin sounds like. Great start. Let's keep going. My name is Savannah, and um, and I'm gonna make the sound of a wolf. Oh! Excellent work, Savannah. Hi, my name is our friend Jarlene, and I'm so excited to show you the Western Screech Owl. Hoo, 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 hoo. Bye. Wow, good job. Someone paid attention in the last episode. Okay, a, a light on the device just turned on. I hope that means it's ready. Awesome. So, I actually have my friend Laura here in the studio. Laura is one of our animal handlers, and with her is animal ambassador, Finn the Red Fox. Hey, Laura. Hi. And hi, Finn. <laughs> okay, Laura, first of all, can you explain what an animal ambassador is? Yeah, of course. So our animal ambassadors are some of our wild animal friends who we take with us all across the country to teach kids about wild animals and how amazing they are and how they're being affected by things in the environment like climate change and things like that. Cool. Now, let's see if the device works. Laura, make sure Finn is close to the mic. All right, come here, Finn. Okay, I think we're good to go. Hi, Finn, can you hear me? Finn, if you can hear me, please respond. Uh, does he usually say more than that? Um, Sometimes, uh, he's really talkative every once in a while, and he loves to sing sometimes, too, but maybe he's just a little shy today. Hmm. Oh, oh no. The status light is flickering. We're out of juice. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. We'll try again next episode. Oh, that's too bad. I really wanted to know what the fox says. 
Hopefully, we'll have some new recordings of animal impersonations by then. Before we go, there is one more quick update. We got a call with a follow-up question to last week's episode. Message one. Hi, this is Lucy from Calgary, Alberta. I just heard you talk about the different ways that animals survive the winter. And since you mentioned that some animals migrate, I was wondering if you know which animals travel the farthest every year. Thanks. Wow, so glad you asked. We don't have time for a full top 10 countdown, but I'm going to give you the top three most amazing migrations. Top three most amazing migrations. Number three. Our friend the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies travel 3,100 kilometers from Canada to Mexico, a trek so long that it takes longer than a butterfly's entire life to finish. If a butterfly starts the trip, its grandchildren will be the ones who actually arrive in the south. Number two. The humpback whale. At over 9,800 kilometers, this is the longest migration of any mammal. Number one. And our winner is the Arctic Tern. This tireless little bird travels up to 71,000 kilometers a year, flying from Greenland and the Arctic all the way to Antarctica, from one end of the world to the other. Incredible! This adds up to 2.4 million kilometers over its 30-year lifespan. That's three times to the moon and back. Houston, this is the Arctic Turn. I'm ready for launch. <laughs> all right, friends. That's it for today. Remember, you can get in touch with us through our email at podcast at earthrangers.com. And you can find tons of cool content as well as all the pictures and videos from this episode at earthrangers.com slash podcast. Just remember to ask your parents before going online. Join me again next time when we discover an animal that can change the color of its fur to blend in with its surroundings. Thanks for listening. Earth Rangers. Earth Rangers. Earth Rangers.